is uh, David Phil, Jane Devon Smith, Christian Stanley, John Muscovitz, and I don't see Joyce yet, but if she shows up, we'll note that as well for the record. This meeting is being recorded, and we ask that um, anybody that has any uh, questions or any uh, concerns that they uh, raise their hand either virtually or turn their camera on. Other than that, please ensure that your microphone stays muted. Uh, so that way we don't have a, a mess of people talking over each other. As of now, we have 59 people in this uh, virtual room. So it's a little bit of a, of a big meeting. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Mosler and the Board of Health for coming up with this idea of doing this virtual question and answer session. And I'll just say from the, from the select board, uh, this is basically your, your meeting. So I know you have some, some presenters that are going to be uh, giving us some good information tonight and answering questions. So I'll just say from the select board standpoint, um, you know, we, we'll pretty much stand by unless you have any direct questions or concerns for us. I'll let the medical experts answer the questions that, uh, that we shouldn't try. So, um, when we get to the question and answer session, if everybody could uh, limit their questions to one per person, since we do have quite a lot of people here, we can you know, take turns. If you have more than one question, we'll come back to you and, and go from there. But uh, Dr. Mosler, if you wanna uh, introduce your, your guests and take it away, please go ahead. Great. Thank you, David. On behalf of the Hadley Board of Health, Greg Mish, Emma Dragon, and myself, I uh, wanna thank you, David, and the Select Board for hosting the meeting, and thanks to everyone who's attending. Uh, I uh, want to briefly uh, explain the uh, flow of the meeting. We have five panelists here. Each panelist will give a short presentation and will be followed by a question and answer related to their area of expertise. Uh, we're going to try to limit the Q&A to approximately 10 minutes for each uh, panelist so we can keep moving along. If your question doesn't get answered, please email the Hadley Board of Health and I will respond. I'll get the answer to you. I would like to introduce our panelists. We have uh, Emma Dragon, who's a member of our Board of Health. She's also the Director of Public Health in Amherst, and she will discuss our local Board of Health work and how it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have Dr. Ann McKenzie, who is the Superintendent of Hadley Schools who will also uh, talk to us a bit about what's happening in our schools and answer questions. I'm here, I'm the chair of the Board of Health and uh, I will uh, be available uh, towards the end to discuss uh, any things that might come up about the uh, vaccine rollout, uh, how we can access it if our uh, other panelists have not been able to address those uh, issues. And um, I'm really pleased we have uh, two out of town guests here. Uh, we have Dr. Esteban Garcia, he's the Chief Medical Officer at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. He's a specialist in pediatric emergency medicine. And we have Dr. Joanne Levin, Medical Director of Infection Prevention at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, Practicing Specialist in Infectious Disease and Chair of the Northampton Board of Health. Uh, we're gonna start with our guests, Dr. Levin and Garcia. We can listen to their presentations and then open up Q&A. After that, we'll move on to our local presenters uh, to share information. I wanna thank Dr. Levin and Dr. Garcia. Uh, our community has close ties to Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Uh, many Hadley residents were born there, some work there, uh, and lots of us receive our healthcare uh, at this vital local institution. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Garcia. Joanne, do you want to start with um, just the overview and then I'll talk? Okay. Great. Um, so I was asked to talk about um, how Cooley Dickinson is doing and uh, what's happening here. Um, just to tell you that we're doing well, we're generally well staffed. Um, there were a few days where our census was higher than normal, but um, we're, we're doing well. We've had beds, we've never turned away any patients. Our ICU is well staffed. Um, we've never gone uh, to have to do anything, uh, at least in this fall, ne never had to do anything extreme to accommodate our patients' needs. Um, and we are uh, offering all services that are non-COVID related in addition to COVID related services. So 
We offer elective surgery. There are occasionally very rare occasions where some of those are, are uh, delayed because we need some uh, beds. But for the most part, all of our services, endoscopy service, surgical services, OB services, everything is, is functioning, um, functioning well. Um, and um, if in the uh, case that uh, someone has COVID, and they need hospitalization. As you know, most people with COVID do not need hospitalization um, and will generally do well at home. Um, but for those folks who might need hospitalization for COVID, we are very well uh, equipped to take care of people with COVID, uh, starting from our emergency room to the medical floors, all the way to the ICU. We have trained specialists in um, hospital medicine, in intensive care medicine, pulmonary medicine, infectious disease medicine. Um, we have all medications that are considered standard therapy for COVID, uh, including remdesivir, which is an antiviral therapy. In the beginning, when remdesivir first came out, there was a shortage of it, and you know we were concerned whether we would have enough. It has now been approved, and we have no problem getting it, and we do use it regularly. Um, we have dexamethasone, which has been shown to uh, improve uh, morbidity and mortality for patients with advanced COVID, and we use that uh, frequently. We also have um, medications which are used less frequently, uh, which our specialists in intensive care medicine do use called tocilizumab. Um, we also have convalescent plasma uh, that we use as needed. Um, so we are um, generally doing well providing medical care for COVID patients as well as non-COVID patients. Um, I thought I'd stop there. Esteban, do you want to talk about other things going on at Cooley? Sure. So uh, I thought I'd touch on vaccines and I'm happy to answer any questions about the vaccine. So I have oversight of our vaccine um, uh, clinic that we currently have. It is, uh, we're following all state recommendations, requirements and guidelines for distribution of the vaccine. So at this point, it's been limited to the first wave, uh, multiple um, uh, alphabets of the first wave. So wave 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. Um, which include uh, healthcare providers that are um, COVID facing. That was the first group of providers that were vaccinated. Um, so that would be folks that are taking care of patients in the emergency department, in the ICUs, in the floor, on the floor, uh, inpatient units, as well as um, the providers taking care of um, patients in our respiratory illness clinic, which is set up for anyone that needs to be seen but could potentially have COVID as well. Um, so lots of opportunity um, uh, for folks to get vaccinated at the hospital. We started about 25 days ago. I think December um, 17th was our first day of vaccines, and we have vaccinated almost um, um, uh, about 1,100 uh, employees have received uh, their primary vaccine and something like 380 their um, secondary vaccine. So we are moving forward with, um, at the state request, um, uh, working through how we will vaccinate um, our community providers. So there are some smaller community or um, community practices um, that need to be vaccinated and they're too small to receive their own shipment of vaccine. It either comes in a big bulk of 975 doses or in a small bulk of 100 doses. So those are um, still too much for many of the practices. So we are doing that for them. Uh, we will be doing that for them hopefully with by the end of the month. Um, and our plan now is to be able to roll out community-based vaccines um, at some point in February, probably mid-February. And that would be to um, community members um, uh, through the CDMG or our medical practice um, that are the first wave of community folks, um, which are the um, uh, folks that are 75 and over um, and, and or two comorbidities. So some other um, illnesses that put them at higher risk. Um, so that's our plan. We're still working through that. I, my call right before this was to talk about how to operationalize, um, you know, uh, upwards of, um, uh, I think our, our numbers are something like uh, potential potentially 100,000 community members um, that could need to be vaccinated um, from the um, high-risk groups to the um, not high-risk groups, essentially 18 and, um, and above, um, over 100,000 members that could potentially need to be vaccinated. So we're working on being able to roll that out. That will take us months um, to be able to do that. And uh, we anticipate starting at some point in February and running probably six months. 
Um, so that is um, the the you know what we're the way we're following that um, to give you a sense of what to expect when you get vaccinated. Um, uh, I am I've been at each of our vaccine clinics for the last uh, month. Um, sore arm, so you know your it's it's upper arm where you get vaccinated. It tends to be sore. Uh, people are are you know feeling that, um, and then um, uh, that's usually on the first vaccine. And um, there are some local side effects, some redness and swelling that you can see. In addition to that. We are, um, we've had some uh, uh, folks that have had a little numbness or tingling in their tongue, a funny sensation. We haven't had anybody that's needed more than a little bit of extra observation. When you get vaccinated, you can expect to be observed for a minimum of 15 minutes after your vaccine. Um, and um, that's that's just routine. Um, and then if there are any side effects that are significant, then those folks usually go to the emergency department. Um, and then we talk to an allergist before we would have them have their second vaccine if indeed it was a significant reaction. And that's the way the system has set it up. So happy to answer any questions about that, but my impression is um, community rollout of vaccines will start um, for high-risk populations uh, at some point in um, early to mid-February is what I understand. Esteban, could you uh, talk a little bit about uh, after someone has received two doses of the vaccine uh, as far as uh, public health measures? Sure. So this is the real challenge, I think, is, you know, we feel like if you've got your vaccine and you're fully, you know, protected, can you can you take your mask off and, and you know, start meeting in groups? And um, you know, our goal from a public health perspective, and I'm sure Joanne can speak to this as well, is to get enough vaccine distributed so that we have something called herd immunity, or we're able to then raise the immunity of everyone and decrease the chance of infection. Um, so that's going to take us months. We would, we would um, really, uh, you know, uh, encourage everyone to continue their current uh, um, uh, precautions, um, wearing your mask, uh, socially distant, um, not engaging with other folks that are not within your immediate bubble um, for the next, you know, probably six months um, um, at least. Um, so even though you'll you'll be protected, there is the the chance that that others in the community won't aren't, and then we don't want to send a message that it's okay not to have your mask on. So we're really pushing that. Um, you know, this is. I think I heard Dr. Fauci say. Um, I'm hopeful in the fall, this is what he said, um, and I agree, I'm hopeful in the fall that we'll be able to um, have, um, you know, family dinner again, go out to dinner and maybe take in a show or uh, go for a walk with your neighbors, um, you know, and, and visit each other, but probably not until, uh, you know, October, September, October, potentially. Susan, I guess you gave me a question ahead of time. Uh, someone had asked, if you have COVID, do you still need vaccine? Um, and the answer is yes, because um, different people react differently to getting COVID. And uh, it's thought that people perhaps who have milder symptoms may not develop as much immunity. Um, so it's really variable from person to person. Um, and since we know vaccine is so effective, it is recommended that everyone get the vaccine. Uh, Dr. Moser, do you want to go to Q and A for this portion, or do you want to? You can do that for us. That'd be great. Okay. So, if you have a question uh, for for anybody at this point, uh, please turn on your camera, wave, well, wave I, your virtual hand. I would say let's take questions for Drs. Levin and Garcia, so that we don't uh, keep them here for uh, too too long. Yep. Perfect. So. Turn on your camera, wave, we'll unmute you and you can ask you your question. Up, oh, and I see uh, is uh, Margaret has a question. Uh, Jennifer, could you, there we go. Uh, did we lose her? No, I'm, I'm here, can I ask my question? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, two questions. Um, can people on chemo receive the vaccine and can pregnant women receive the vaccine? 
So um, certainly pregnant women can receive the vaccine um, that's been um, uh, discussed. Um, I think that there's uh, the recommendation even from the society, um, uh, the obstetrical society is that um, especially in high risk situations um, uh, for pregnant women. So uh, healthcare workers, uh, potentially teachers, um, those folks who are going to be around um, uh, vaccines. I, you know, I think it's a different story if you are um, at the very end of your pregnancy or, or something along those lines, but absolutely safe for folks to receive the um, the vaccine from what we understand. Um, and I, I don't see any indications um, uh, with chemotherapy for there to be an, a contraindication. Joanne, have you heard? No, I've not heard anything specific about chemotherapy. I'll just say that this is not a live vaccine. This cannot right. cause disease. Um, so I, I don't, I wouldn't anticipate that it would be. An yeah, there's, there's almost no contraindications to the vaccine um, other than allergic reaction to the uh, preservative in the vaccine, which is very common in many, many things. Um, and so unlikely to be, uh, to cause an allergy. Does it matter what uh, trimester? Not that I'm aware of, no. One of the reasons is that, um, well, it is encouraged that uh, women who are pregnant or about to get pregnant, I discuss this with their healthcare provider to have a sort of a discussion of the risk and benefit. There is some evidence that uh, pregnant women may have a worse, a slightly worse outcome with COVID compared to the non-pregnant um, people their age, um, but it's a very slight increase and it's not thought to be a high risk situation, uh, but it is something perhaps worth discussing um, with their provider. Sure. Um, looked like we had a question that was looking at where does um, 65 and above fall. So interestingly enough, the CDC did release recently their recommendations that anybody over 65 um, should be, you know, high priority and get vaccinated. Um, I think our state is following a bit of a different um, uh, approach uh, in that we're looking at really 75 and above to be those people that are first first out the door. Um, but I think 65 and especially, you know, um, comorbidities, so multi, uh, diabetes, hypertension, other things that we know, um, COPD, asthma, some of the others. And there's a list, I think, of comorbidities that kind of count. Um, but certainly um, we'll follow, be following very quickly thereafter. I think your well 20-year-old will be very far into the, sum, uh, into the summer, um, which is appropriate. Uh, we have Melissa finding on the screen. Yes, thank you. I have a question regarding how do we control the, the, the population of the people receiving the vaccine? For example, uh, you know, first responders, hospital workers, I get. But what about visiting nurses, all those people going into homes um, and nursing homes? Uh, cause I heard we have a, a spike and in nursing homes and, you know, I wonder where they are falling on the vaccine sure. list, so please. So thank you. Great question. The good news is that um, CVS has started to vaccinate our um, long-term care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, um, and their um, employees, uh, from what I understand, and their employees as well. Um, and that has started. So the, the, the state separated out um, um, kind of uh, hospital-based um, uh, yeah, uh, providers, healthcare providers and healthcare workers, and um, separated that out and gave the responsibility of the long-term care facilities to um, uh, uh, contracts with CVS and some of the other pharmacy chains. Um, it, it is believed that people will be able to get vaccinated at the pharmacy chains as well um, down the road when they are, have finished doing that work that they're doing, because um, uh, that will be another opportunity for folks to get vaccinated. So, so that's ongoing and happening, and rightly so, very high-risk population, and it's, it spreads quickly from one of those areas to the other. Um, we've included um, visiting nurses and as part of our, our um, vaccine strategy. Um, so anybody that goes into the home with patients that cares for COVID patients or potential COVID patients are included. Um, our nurses are being vaccinated. Our PTOT rehab folks are all being vaccinated um, as well. So they're included um, in that wave um, of COVID-facing folks um, uh, as appropriate. Okay, so it's just Cooley Dickinson nursing homes or is it no, the nursing homes are the, the state has contracted okay, to, the state. Thank right, you. the state is covering the, the, the nursing homes, um, from what I understand. Emma has uh, other information, so. 
No, no, just additional information. So I know the that mass DPH, yes, that private, um, but we're using a, a combination of public and private partnerships to really get the vaccine out there. Um, the phase distribution is very scripted and regimented to try and not create disparities to have it become as equitable as a rollout throughout the state as they can do. Um, I know that long-term care facilities in our area have, have already started getting the vaccine. I believe Hadley at Elaine, it was last week that they got the vaccine for all of their staff and many of their patients as well as Sika and Linda Manor, all the facilities in the area. Um, Melissa, in terms of home healthcare workers, they um, are actually phase one, step five of the distribution, which is coming very soon. And I actually have a short PowerPoint with some data and actually some detail about the rollout, which I can talk about once Dr. Gar um, well, Garcia that. is all set. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Charlene, next. We, we have a question in the chat about um, if the vaccine uh, will affect, how it would affect a person with a penicillin allergy. Sure. So we don't believe that there's any, um, the really any um, overlap in allergy to food allergies, um, drug allergies. Um, the vaccine is, is very well um, tolerated in, in those individuals. So I, I don't think there's any, any reason to be concerned. Um, I think if, there, if you are concerned before you get vaccinated, it does make sense to just chat with your provider, your nurse practitioner or physician, um, and just make sure. Um, but, and, and we also have at Cooley um, a, an allergist that's available to support practices or other other um, questions that people have, but uh, penicillin allergy should be fine to the vaccine. Okay. Uh, Charlene, I, you're still muted, but go ahead with your question if you can. Uh, you're, you're still muted. Oh, tell there me if go. that worked. Did that work? Yep. Oh, yep, that's great. perfect. Oh, I was going to say, um, my next door neighbor, his father that lives with him is 90 and uh, in poor health. So for those people over 75, I was just going to tell them whatever information I found out. Is it going to be at all like through the senior centers? Is there a way they could sign up? So I can tell you how we're doing it. And then Emma can probably speak to the to the other other opportunities. So through Cooley, if they are if they're actually Cooley patients through CDMG, we will be making outreaches to all of our patients that are 75 and over very soon um, to be able to get them engaged. Um, I'm not sure how the other private practices are doing, um, but to be able to get them engaged and to be able to give them a time and an appointment to come in. So that's something that we're going to be doing. But again, those initially for us are going to be our specific patients that have been in our system within the last couple of years, either visited a primary care physician or, um, one of our subspecialists. So that's how we're going to focus ours. Um, okay. and I, yeah. And then Emma, I, I, I know how. I yeah. think he's a veteran. I don't know if he goes because uh, my neighbor was talking about trying to reach out to the VA or something. Yeah, I, I think what's really highlighted here is everyone's enthusiasm for this vaccine to roll out. I, I It's really great to see that everyone's inquisitive and, and wants to have all the information to move forward. I think one thing that I think Dr. Garcia and Dr. Levin can kind of echo is, is DPH is trying to really make sure that the information when it's released is accurate. Um, and concise and understandable. And that way, ch plans don't change once they're out there. Um, sure. So the state's going to be, there's going to be vaccination by these private practices, like Cooley Dickinson Medical Group, People's Primary Cares. There's also going to be designated mass vaccination sites across the state, one of which being Gillette. Um, and I believe the Big E is being looked at to be another site. Wow. Um, in addition to that, local health departments are also um, gearing up to be engaged. I know with the first responder vaccine distribution for Hampshire County, uh, the towns of Amherst and Northampton stood up sites to support all of our Hampshire County communities for first responders um, because we're the two largest 
towns. And with this vaccine rollout, there's a lot of um, back end preparing uh, and storage and, and making sure that we're enrolled with all of these providers to be able to get it per- executed in a safe fashion. So um, Amherst and Northampton were the two that were prepared for that. I, I got my vac- I got the Moderna vaccine in Florida on January 3rd. No reactions at all. Okay, so it's great to hear. Yeah, I, I want to add um, that uh, sometime in the over the next many weeks, the state will be launching a website. And on okay. that website will be an interactive map. On the map will be all the sites that are offering the vaccine. You can click on one of the sites and that will uh, give you information and enable you to sign up for the vaccine. Assume oh. that it is your turn uh, in the in the key. Oh, great! Thank every thank you, everyone. So I just I, wanted to Sarah in the chat asked the question. I'm over 75. How will I know when and where I can get the vaccine? Um, so, would what's your recommendation to somebody that? You know, should they call DPH? Should they go on a website uh, or just watch what website should they be watching? It, it will, the information will be, if you go to the ma.gov website and you click on the COVID, um, the, the big problem is there's so much information there. It's hard sometimes. It can be a little frustrating to get where you want. I think my understanding from the meeting yesterday is that there will be a, a distinct area on the website under the COVID heading where they uh, will again have this interactive map. And in addition, uh, we have a visual uh, that we can put up. Can somebody put up that, Jen, put up that visual now? Uh, I, I have it on my PowerPoint. Can you put it up for us, Emma? I don't know if I can share my screen. Anyway, th- this is a... Uh, um, this is a, a visual of the phases of the vaccine rollout. Uh, this particular uh, document is updated every Tuesday and Thursday by the state because who's eligible to get the vaccine has been a bit of a moving target. But you can keep an eye on that uh, on that visual. And right here, we have it right here. I don't know what just happened here. Hold on. Ah, here we go. Okay. Um, I don't know what happened here. I got my screen got minimized. Anyway, uh, you can see on on that. Is it up for people to see? I can't see it myself. Uh, you can see on yes. the visual the different uh, uh, phases, and within the phases are different steps of prioritization. Uh, and on this website, you will know when you are eligible, and you will be able to click on the map, find a site, and get yourself signed up for a vaccine. Uh, right now, it's a work in progress. Again, like uh, Emma said. The state is not putting information out until they have it organized and that they know indeed where these sites will be. So I think uh, we need some patience now, which is very difficult. And we will all have our turn for the vaccine. So if I could just do a last call for any questions for uh, Dr. Garcia or Dr. Levin, since uh, I'm sure they have other things to get to. Um, any specific question for those two individuals? Turn your camera on, wave. Looks uh, like Gary's oh, waiting. Yep, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. There we go. I, 
I can't seem to hear you. Is your microphone plugged in working? Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like your audio is working. Uh, if, if you're able, could you type your question in the chat possibly? Give you a minute to do that. And then if anybody else has any, any questions in the meantime. Uh, anybody else? Uh, the only other thing I did want to say is that um, if you are in one group and you feel that you have extenuating circumstances and you should be in an earlier group, uh, there is an email address that you can uh, send a, a request to the state and ask for a waiver. And I will, I don't, I will put that, uh, that email address on our Hadley Board of Health website. Linda, Linda go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is uh, for the hospital. I heard them mention the medications. I was glad to hear you had Redesivir and, and those number of others uh, because I also thought they were rare. Do you use the um, uh, the antibodies infusions? The antibody infusions are actually more geared for people who are not sick enough to be in the hospital. Um, they're they're meant for very early in disease. Uh, so currently the antibodies are really approved for patients um, who have certain comorbidities. I think it's age over 65 and a BMI greater than 35. Um, through our connection with uh, MGB, which is what used to be called partners with Mass General, uh, we do have the ability to refer patients for antibodies. It's been interesting when the antibodies first became available, we thought there would be, uh, there's a, a shortage and it would be hard to accommodate all those folks. And it turns out that um, even when patients are offered the antibodies, many patients don't want them or don't quite get there, but they have to be uh, given within a, a short time after a patient tests positive. Uh um, and so through our connection with MGB, our patients um, through um, Cooley Medical Group and through the hospital are eligible to be seen in Boston. There are two sites in Boston where that's being given. We are not giving it locally uh, at this time, um, but it is um, patients within our system are eligible for that. I believe Bay State also has um, a way to give those antibodies, but again, they're meant for earlier in disease and the goal is to keep people out of the hospital. So there, we're not doing that in the hospital. So you recommend if you're, if someone is early and that, that they make contact really soon if they're not feeling well. Okay. Right, so um, basically people um, who fit those comorbidities um, can be offered that and um, so we would be in touch with their primary care and then. Mm -hmm. from there. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, Jerry's question came over. Uh, the question is, is there any consideration for minorities where the death rate is higher, such as 66 for blacks and 62 for, uh, for Latinos? Well, I mean, I do know that there's been, uh, you know, a consider uh, considerable, um, and I was just reading another email from um, the our, the system we're part of uh, consideration and, and really looking at underrepresented minority groups and being able to engage them. The question of whether there's some vaccine hesitancy in folks um, that have traditionally been, um, you know, really um, not treated well by the healthcare system and whether we should try to do more to engage them. Clearly, we should. Um, one of the things we did at Cooley as part of the rollout for us was that we made sure that it was, if you were in a department that was COVID facing, regardless of your role, um, we wanted to include you in that wave, that first wave. So it, it includes um, uh, not just, you know, front facing doctors and nurses, but really anybody in those departments. Um, I think there's lots of work that needs to still happen. Um, and I know the state has taken um, ec uh, equitable distribution as a priority, but uh, the public health folks maybe could answer this better than I can. Um, I think that the Department of Public Health is evaluating the, the criteria for the rollout every day. I think that we've seen that with 
the addition of 911 dispatchers to phase one distribution with first responders that they have moved up 75 and over I th- and also evaluating professional positions and their risk status. So I think there's more to come with this. I think that it's being updated regularly. Um, and I think just check back often and, and see what's up to date. I think, Melissa, did you have one last question for either of the two doctors? No, sorry. That was my teen son. Oh, okay. (laughs) All right. right, Well, um, Dr. Garcia and Dr. Levin, thank you so, so much for, uh, for joining us. I think we, uh, I know myself, I, I learned a lot and I'm sure that everybody else did. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. Have a good evening. Okay, and we will uh, we will move on. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. McKenzie, our superintendent of schools. I've both worked with her and observed her work with others. Uh, I can tell you uh, she's an invaluable asset to the town of Hadley. Her diligence, her intelligence, uh, and compassion are truly remarkable, and uh, I will say no more. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Mosler. I just want to be, thank you Select Board for organizing this. Thank you to uh, Emma Dragon for assisting with coordinating this for, to everyone. Thank you and thank you to the community for being here. I also wanna clarify for the community, um, doctor meaning I'm just Annie. I wrote a really long thing called a dissertation that nobody, not even my mother read, but I don't want anyone thinking that if they're feeling ill, I'm the person to see. I will actually run away screaming. So I just wanna clarify. The um, hero doctors that we heard from just a moment ago, I, I just wrote a really long, boring dissertation. All right, so what I'd like to do if I can is share with the community. I know for those of you who are parents, you see these data every single week when I put them in my newsletter, but it might be helpful for the community to understand where the schools have been, where we are now, and um, what's on the horizon. I don't know who the host is, but is there any way that I can be made a co-host to screen share? And if that happened, it did. Great, thank you. Okay, so what folks are looking at now is um, the weekly dashboard data that I put together for our students and families. And um, the date, this dashboard date, these links link directly to the COVID weekly dashboard. You can see when I click on that, it will take you to the Department of Public Health, Massachusetts DPHs weekly COVID-19 public health report for that week. The school committee back in August and in July and August when schools were talking about reopening, uh, we knew a lot less than we know now about COVID. There's still a lot to learn and people were terrified about schools reopening. That's something that you can see in the fact that very few public schools actually did open in the Commonwealth for in-person learning. And when I say that people were terrified, I don't say that in a demeaning way, because the truth is we had no idea. We had no idea if um, having schools open and students in school, we didn't know the effect that that would have on community transmission rates. And when you don't know, and we had a disease that was as novel and scary as COVID-19, people understandably really wanted to make sure that they were careful. So the unknown was if we open schools, uh, are we going to see rates of community transmission skyrocket? Back in August, and so we decided here um, that based on guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, based on our look at some of the recommendations from Harvard School of Public Health, um, we decided that Uh, It was imperative that we open schools. We, in-person learning uh, was available to our students. In September, about 50% of children in the district were eligible to attend in-person beginning in September and 100% of our faculty and staff were coming to work beginning um, in late August. The numbers at that time, and we also asked ourselves, 
well, how will we know when we should do something differently? And we thought about moving forward in phases in terms of making in-person learning available to 100% of students. Um, and we talked about how, we, how would we decide when we needed to step back from in-person learning and do something uh, and have remote learning. We looked at the recommendations from the Harvard Public School of, uh, School of Public Health. And um, at that time, although some of this has, they revisited this, they just recently uh, published something on December 18th, um, where they're rethinking what some of these thresholds should be. But at that time, the recommendation, you can see thresholds and indicators over here. And these top two thresholds and indicators for community transmission. Um, so by threshold, we mean at what point do we make a different decision? By indicator, we mean what things are we looking at to make our decisions? Um, and so the recommendation at that time from these health experts was if you have incidents per 100,000 people that's less than one, you essentially have almost non-existent community transmission. If you have, and there's maybe a better way to look at it here, that's CDC, let me just scroll down here. Yeah. Um, so you're on track for containment um, and you just need to monitor with viral testing and contact tracing. Again, this was the report back in July and August. If you have incidence rates between one to nine per 100,000 people, just for a reference point, if you're not aware, Hampshire County is about 160,000 people, it's 164,000. Uh, then it's, if it's between one and nine, community spread is occurring. Uh, what you need to make sure you have are test and trace programs available uh, in the community. Between 10 and 24, average daily incidence rate per 100,000. You're seeing accelerated spread. And at that time, stay at home orders and or test and trace would be recommended. And 25 or greater, at that point in time, um, the Harvard Global Health Institute said, you're probably at a tipping point. So our school committee said, here's what we'd like to see in order to progress um, forward with in-person learning and to progress into um, additional phases, increased in-person learning. We definitely want to see average daily incidence rates per 100,000 below 25. And we'd like to see testing positivity rates in Hampshire County below 3%. And we never want to see evidence of school transmission. And as you can see in the summer, at the end of the summer and in early fall, um, things, were, things were looking great. And they started to tick up a bit. So we saw Columbus Day had some effect on average daily incidence rate. Um, testing positivity was really held at a low level. Uh, our colleges around here did a fantastic job of surveillance testing and that really helped maintain low testing positivity rates because so many people were getting tested. Testing positivity also gets very high if you're not testing enough people and you're essentially only testing sick people. But having the colleges be so systematic in what they were doing, that certainly helped. We see what happens around Columbus Day, um, and then we see what starts happening around the holidays, right? You see this uptick. The graphs and charts also just take these data and put them in a chart format. So on December 17th was uh, a storm starting on December 18th. Unfortunately, our students moved to remote learning. And um, I say, unfortunately, because we want children in school, but our community transmission rates um, continue to escalate. Now I will say, and the, the school committee uh, continually asks the question, are we using the right thresholds and metrics? Um, what should be revisited and when? And as I said, um, Harvard has published a report, Path to Zero, and they just updated some of their recommendations and that was published in late December. Um, so these are the indicators that we use, incidence rate per 100,000 people, testing positivity rate over the last 14 days for Hampshire County, so we do our incident rate for Hampshire County, and we always, if there's any evidence of school transmission, 
that's immediate. Then we would take, if we think uh, we're seeing COVID-19 transmission in schools, we would immediately um, make sure that we ceased in-person learning until we could contain any outbreak that we saw in the school. So those are the thresholds and indicators that we use. The state of play right now is that we're in remote learning at this point in time because of uh, what we're seeing with community transmission. And we are constantly evaluating what makes the most sense. Um, we are a district that's designed for in-person learning and that's always our goal. And uh, we wanna be mindful that we are not um, creating unnecessary risk for, there's a lot of research around transmission, particularly around younger children and severity of disease with younger children. But we have to remember that we have adults who work in the schools and often we have many older adults working in the schools. Um, and so the concern is that when community transmission rates are high, it does not mean that they will result in school transmission but it does increase the likelihood that someone from the community will introduce COVID-19 into the schools. And the implications for people working in those environments, well, that's not entirely clear and it could be pretty serious. So that's why at this moment in time, we're in remote learning. And we do hope that by people adhering to mitigation strategies, and I say, um, you know, even if somebody asks questions about, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure if that really works. Do you really have to do these things that, that the CDC tells us repeatedly? Wear a mask, stay six feet apart, um, avoid mixing with people outside of your household um, to every extent possible. And I completely understand that folks might say, I'm exhausted, this has gotten to be too much. Does it really, is it really that important? And, or some people might say, well, I'm so healthy. I mean, how bad would it be? And I just say, if for no other reason, Hadley is a great community. This is a great community. I, I say all the time, the tagline here should be Hadley cares. People, they care about their community. They care about each other. So if you're wondering whether or not you should alter your behavior, I would say, if you're not motivated to do it for yourself, do it for your neighbor. Do it for your neighbor who may have young children and having them at home is not only difficult for the children, but creating an inordinate financial strain for them and a lot of stress in their household. Do it for the elderly person you don't know. Do it so uh, for our teachers so that they can feel more confident and comfortable with students in person and schools being open. So even if you're not highly motivated to do it for yourself, I do, I do want to appeal to the decency that I believe is inherent in every person in this community. Um, if you need to modify your behavior on, for your neighbor, for your community, um, and for your schools. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Really uh, well said. And uh, of course, we... Uh, the Board of Health echoes all of your recommendations. You know, we're, we're in this together and uh, we have to think of the greater good. David, you wanna see any, if there's questions? Sure, yeah, anybody have any questions for Dr. McKenzie? Nothing at all, huh? Oh, that's great. You know, you folks need to come to my school committee. This is how I like a meeting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. Well, well yeah. If people are getting tired. I, it's past my bedtime. Uh, the, the next panelist is uh, our own Emma Dragon, who uh, will speak with us a little bit, I hope, about... Uh, the Board of Health and what we do re around uh, COVID. Maybe talk about some of our numbers. Yeah, so I'm also gonna ask for, for permission if I can be granted a share. Um, I don't know what people can, can people see my screen here? Yes. Great. All right, so 
Local boards of health um, are really tasked with this incredible amount of responsibility throughout the pandemic, especially in Massachusetts. There are 351 individual boards of health throughout the state. Uh, they are not state or federally funded. Uh, therefore, in many, the attrition of years, uh, funding and professional support for them has really been limited throughout the last years, which has made us kind of in a tough space right now to be able to address this pandemic. In terms of Western Massachusetts, we have lots of small towns that don't have professionalized health departments, um, which has made the response to COVID incre incredibly difficult. Uh, local health departments and boards of health, we are tasked with doing that contact tracing, um, having public health nurses enter information into MAVEN, which is the state epidemiological software. We are tasked with assuring that people that are in quarantine or isolation have access to food, medication, water, safe uh, ability to quarantine or isolate, um, as well as people around them being able to be safe as well. Throughout this pandemic, I think the understanding of the public with what local public health in Massachusetts does has, has grown, uh, but there's still more to come. Um, in terms of this new wave with the vaccine planning, local health departments, due to that attrition in professional staff and, and funding, uh, have some challenges with being active and out there with distributing the vaccine in a way where institutions like Cooley Dickinson and our private partners of CVS and Walmart and Walgreens pharmacies will be able to distribute the vaccines. With that being said, here on this slide, you can see uh, the vaccine planning update. We already kind of went over that visual and where we are. And this is that new uh, tool that Dr. Mosler was describing earlier in the meeting where this just came out and I believe got put on the website today. If you look in terms of where am I and you open phase one, DPH realized that, wow, we are all, we all have so many questions. Even us that are in it have lots of questions all the time. So they really wanted to be able to give a visual tool with lots of descriptors and detail so people can have a better understanding. So here we can see that we are in the phase one distribution of timing. And then if we go to the next slide, they even have these great arrows here at the top. So we're in the second week of January. And then here on the left are all of the areas that DPH, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health has started to vaccinate with COVID. So that includes all COVID facing healthcare workers, long-term care facilities, po police, EMS and fire and dispatchers. And we, they have just started congregate care settings uh, through the private partnership of those pharmacies this week. Certainly the timing of all of this is estimated. So, because while we can plan as best we can, we are at the, um, we have to receive the vaccine from the distributors, from those big tech groups. So, and we're not just fighting for these vaccines for Massachusetts, we're competing with them from institutions through across the United States and also the world. So that's something to think about. That's pretty remarkable. Here, they just also, lot, lot, whoop. does that ever happen to you guys? My tongue got tied up there. Um, so here they have a, detailed site in terms of when can I be vaccinated and where can I go to be vaccinated if I'm part of that selected wave um, that's active right now. And then I thought we would talk about the data with where we are today. So a couple of weeks ago, MassDPH reviewed and revised the dashboard that they were using. This one um, is a little bit more intuitive. I think they break it out a little bit better, which is nice. Um, so here we can see the breakdown of cases throughout the state and the age breakdowns of those 
the generalized hospitalizations, the amount of individuals in ICU, and the average age of the individual um, of a person who's hospitalized, which is 73 in the state. And this is data that was from yesterday, but yesterday there was over 5,000 new confirmed cases in Massachusetts. Here, we can see the data trends. I, our testing, I think this is interesting since March, our testing really has not been as robust as we were at the beginning of March. Um, our hospitalizations are up again, not quite as high as we were in April. But here, if we see our cases in Massachusetts, we can see that ebb, this, I mean, this rise here in the spring, but then really here, since after the holiday season, how severe our levels are right now. So here is our, a look at Western Mass and COVID cases here with the same visual. Um, our COVID cases by county, Hampshire County, uh, us in Western Mass, our population density is much lower than other places in the state, which is good for infectious diseases that are respiratory in nature, which have a high level of in infectivity um, in cities where people are closer together. When we look at the data for where was our percent positivity from the beginning of the week? We were at uh, last week, it was 6%, which is pretty remarkable. The state released the data that will go out in the dashboard tomorrow to the local health departments this afternoon. And, and I will say once again, um, that Hadley was higher than Amherst as well, over 4% this week. I think a question that all of us have, or at least I have is, who in our town is positive? Where have we been seeing these cases? So I broke them down into like this nice table because I like graphs, I'm a visual learner. And this is the cases over the last six months. And these are community cases. So I took out a large population, that group of uh, long-term care facility residents and, and patients at Hadley and Elaine. So here we can see, I think as we all suspect, a big amount of cases here with our young adults um, in there, but we also see quite a number of child-related cases. And so that's just something to think about. In terms of our young adult cases, what age group is really having the most fun out there and still interacting with one another and not doing puzzles like I do at home by myself? Um, so it's really the 18 to 21 year olds. And then we see uh, a drop as the, the age gets older. So more positivity with that college age population that I think we can all kind of understand. Here's a scatter graph of cases over the last six months uh, with their age without Hadley and Elaine in there. And what I think you can see here is this is in that August little bit of a surge that we had, but really the cases in Hadley since the fall are, are consistent throughout our community. They aren't um, just specific to a facility or an age group. Um, and then this is including that skilled nurse facility for that same visual. And then I thought this would be interesting to kind of see, I wish I had gotten a line here, but I wasn't, I didn't have enough time from leaving work tonight to this great meeting to make it perfect, um, but I tried. But here we can kind of see the amount of cases that Hadley has um, in our community at, right now in the last couple months. And then I think that was great that Annie talked about Hadley Cares. I know one thing that was important to us as a board of health, uh, with our funding that we were able to get through CARES grants just specific for the health department is that we wanted to be out there. We wanted to help you all. I think you, you saw us at voting. You saw us at the trunk or treat, um, giving out hand sanitizers and with our Hadley CARES logo. Uh, and, and yes, I know it's tireless and it's the same thing we hear every day, but wash your hands 
cover your face, maintain space and gatherings. Um, and when you're able to get the vaccine, get it. And it's going to help all of us in our community. Thank you, Emma. David, you want to see if there's any questions? Sure. Anybody? Christian's got a question. I have a quick question. Maybe it's relative. Um, I actually have a relative that was diagnosed with something else besides COVID and has to have surgery. And I'm just wondering, is there any priority treatment for or priority in the line for getting a vaccine if you have to go to a hospital for some kind of treatment? I, I know that I don't have the answer to that. I think that's a great question. Um, and one of those that we're gonna learn more a little bit as time goes on. Um, I think, cause I know with some other procedures, sometimes you ha do have to get that preventative vaccine, but I think this is so new that we're learning things every day, Christian. I don't know if Dr. Mosler might have another answer. I, I, I do, do not have an answer and I don't think, uh, I don't think one's available yet. Uh, Again, uh, you know, there it, at least twice a week, but oftentimes more. All of that priority chart is is shifting around, so keep an eye on it. Thank you. Sorry to ask you a stump stump question right off the yeah, bat. <laughs> a good question. Any other questions? Turn your camera on and wave, or raise that virtual hand. Uh, did we miss any in the chat here? No, it doesn't look like it. All right. All right. Dr. Moser, do you have anything else? Yeah, great. Uh, well, yeah, no, thank you to everyone. I just wanted to give a, a, while he was not a panelist tonight, I want everyone to know that uh, there are three of us on the Board of Health, Emma, myself, and Greg Mish, and he brings uh, institutional history and depth of knowledge and we would be lost without him. So I don't know if he's on the call now, but uh, thank you, Greg, for all your work. He's not doing a lot of COVID facing work, but he's doing all of the other work that uh, the Board of Health uh, is charged with doing. So thank you everybody. And uh, this was great. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, if nobody on the select board has any other business, if I could get a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. And motion by Jane, second by Christian. And Jennifer, I think your audio is still broken. So uh, I guess I'll do the roll call. Uh, me, yes. Uh, Jane? Yes. <laughs> Christian? Yes. And John? Yes. All righty. That's it for tonight. See you next Wednesday for our next select board meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Good night.